to stop recording. So thank you very much, Luke, for agreeing to give our seminar this week. I was going to do a quick introduction. So Luke is a lecturer in planetary geoscience at the University of Glasgow. He was over in Australia in Curtin University for his PhD. Jimmy Way got excited by um, doing atom probe tomography. So Luke, uh, Luke's research interests are really focused on studying carbonaceous chondrite meteorites using various different microanalytical tools, including cutting edge atom probe tomography techniques in order to understand the environment around the young sun when it first started to shine and how water and other volatiles were delivered to the earth from um, an atomic perspective. He's a participating scientist in the Japanese Space Agency's Hayabusa 2 mission to return samples from the asteroid, I don't know how to say that, Luke, you're going to have to help me out here. Uh, Ryugu. Ryugu, okay. Learned something new. Um, and he also co-leads the operation of the UK Fireball Network to come um, where they look for meteorites coming to the UK and go out and find where they are, including the recent meteorite fall um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess that was now. So thanks, Luke, for again, and looking forward to your seminar. Oh yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I guess I'll quickly share my screen um, and go to the beginning of this presentation, not the middle. Um, yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's really nice to come and speak to you um, about, uh, yeah, some of the research we've been doing uh, at Glasgow, uh, also um, in collaboration with our sort of like colleagues over in Australia at Curtin University and the University of Sydney um, and the University of Oxford and the University of Portsmouth using Atom Probe to explore how our solar system came to be uh, and uh, sort of get a, literally an atom's eye view uh, of how planets form, how our solar system formed, how stars form. So I'm a planetary scientist and to kind of give you a kind of overview about what kind of questions we're getting at in planetary science, um, it's basically how do you build solar systems, how do you build planets? How do you go from like a big ball of gas and dust in a giant molecular cloud, start collapsing that down under its own gravity till eventually you have the pressures and temperatures in the core of that that are sufficient to kick off nuclear fusion to form a star? Um, how does the swirling disk of gas and dust around that young sun start coming together to form bigger and bigger bodies? How do they interact and collide to eventually form the planetary system we see today? with a third rock from the sun that has life on it that's arguably intelligent. Um, now, from my perspective, pretty much all the action happens in this protoplanetary disk stage. So when you've got your nice young sun um, and the swirling disk of gas and dust around it, that really sets the scene for everything that comes next. Um, this protoplanetary disk is this sort of like mixture of gases uh, and dust fragments. And as you go further out, you get ices. Um, and there are a whole lot of processes that are kind of going on here. You have a temperature gradient where it's kind of obviously really hot, quite close to the sun, out to sort of very cold uh, further out. You have what's called the proverbial snow line, uh, out width of which water is in the ice phase and in width of which uh, water is in the gas phase. Um, and then you have these particles interacting, moving in and out, uh, all sorts of fun processes. Uh, and with sort of advances in sort of telescopes, uh, for example, the ALMA telescope, we are now able to start seeing these protoplanetary disks in our own galaxy forming at the present day. So these images are real, they're not artist impressions, they are uh, snapshots of protoplanetary disks in our galaxy that are forming right now. And the kind of really neat thing about these images is you can kind of see the there's structure here. It's not this homogenous disk that we kind of used to think. It's separated into or segregated into these ring systems. Um, we think that, well, there's kind of two ways you can do this. Uh, one is you form a giant planet, sort of like Jupiter, that very quickly clears out its local neighborhood, generating that ring system. But there are also numerical sim simulations that show, like the one on my right, show that Basically, you can get this just by disk instability. So you don't need giant, giant plants to form. You will generate ring-like systems uh, in protoplanetary disks just by having a star with a disk of gas and dust around it. So these are kind of two top competing ideas about how you generate this structure. Um, one of the kind of key questions in all of this is where did Earth's water come from? 
Earth formed within that snow line uh, where um, uh, water was in the gas phase and so should have formed relatively dry and which is at odds with the nice pale blue dark blue planet that we inhabit today. So one of the kind of key questions in this sort of evolution of the protoplanetary disk evolution of planets is where did Earth's oceans come from that give us this nice habitable world that we can live in quite nicely. Um, and how did that disk evolve? How did how do those sort of different reservoirs, do we have a ring system in our own solar system? How do those rings interact? Um, another way we can kind of look at that is by look, using astronomy techniques to look out at our own solar system, looking at where asteroids are right now to try and piece together uh, sort of like the current structure of our solar system and then work that back in time to the early period of the solar system. Um, so these are near Earth objects that uh, sort of NASA is tracking and there are sort of several thousand or hundreds of thousands of objects above, above the size of a bus that uh, NASA is keeping track of in our local neighborhood, which is quite busy. The good news is none of these are coming anywhere near us uh, in the next 100,000 years, so that's nice. Um, but, and this kind of ties into the sort of camera network stuff we've been uh, sort of exploring where we see stuff fall out of the sky. Um, other ways people have been trying to do this is by using sample return missions, so sending probes out to asteroids to bring material back to Earth. Uh, for study in our laboratories to sort of see what's out there in our solar system. So there was the Hayabusa mission uh, to the asteroid Itakawa, uh, which brought back maybe 300 whole particles from its surface. Um, and they, uh, I'm going to talk about this a bit later, they gave me three whole particles, so 1% of the total material to destroy in the atom probe, uh, which was really nice of them. There was also the Stardust mission that flew through the tail of a comet to give us an understanding about what comets are made of. And there are two ongoing missions uh, called OSIRIS-REx, which is a NASA-led mission to the asteroid Bennu, and Hayabusa-2, which I'm uh, also a participating scientist on, uh, to the asteroid Ryugu. Um, and no uh, list of this would be complete without mentioning Apollo, which got loads of samples back for, from the moon, really like changed the game in terms of our understanding about how the Earth-Moon system formed with that kind of giant impact hypothesis. In terms of sample return missions, I wanted to show you this touch and go uh, video from Osiris Rex, uh, which is just unbelievable, where they went down and kind of sampled that asteroid. I'll let that video go again because it's just unreal how cool it is. So you've got this kind of new, new like Hoover going down, firing a jet of gas, kicking up all this dust. And I think they got a couple of kilos into their sample canister, which is currently on its way back. Uh, the Hayabusa 2 mission landed safely in December and has about five grams of fresh. Uh, asteroid surface for us to study, which is amazing. But space comes to us and we see these fireballs all the time. Uh, they sort of, and at the end of that, if we're lucky, a little meteorite drops out. Uh, and through using camera networks on Earth, we can kind of see these things fall, figure out where they landed, but also figure out their orbits and where they came from in space. Um, and so we have a whole wealth of meteorites on Earth, uh, and they can tell us a lot about how our solar system formed. There are kind of three main types. There are stony meteorites, stony iron meteorites, and iron meteorites. Iron meteorites are great because, as the name suggests, they're made up of iron and nickel metals, and they come from the cores of uh, old, long-dead planets that grew big enough to separate themselves out into a core mantle crust structure. They're really good because not only they tell us about how cores formed on other worlds, but they also give us an indication about what Earth's core looks like because we don't have samples of our own Earth because it's dark and deep and hot and squishy down there. We just can't drill that deep. So by look, studying iron meteorites, we can understand uh, what our own core might be made of. The stony iron meteorites are kind of a mixture of iron, metal and rock, uh, normally a mineral called olivine. Uh, it used to be thought that they came from the core mantle boundary uh, of protoplanet, so the sort of the gap between the metal core uh, and the silicate mantle. Uh, however, some recent sort of magnetic and microstructural studies suggest that actually more likely these things probably came uh, or formed in one of the most cataclysmic events of our solar system, where two protoplanets collided. The upper mantle of one of them merges with the core, uh, a metallic core of another, producing this beautiful meshwork of metal embedded uh, in rock. And then there's the stony meteorites, which is where I spend most of my time studying. There's the achondrites on one side, which come from the crust, that upper surface of planets. They look very much like the sort of rocks we see on our own Earth surface, so like lava flows, impact breaches, uh, all those kind of things. And then there's the chondrites, uh, and they're my favorite rock. That's what I spend most of my time studying. 
Uh, essentially, every mineral inside these formed within the first few million years of our solar system's formation. They're, so they're the oldest rocks in our solar system, the oldest rock you'll ever hold. Um, and they herald back to an era before there were planets. So these are the building blocks of all the other meteorites I've just discussed and the planetary system in our solar system. And so by studying them, we can get an understanding about what the environment around our young sun was like right when it first started to shine. Um, I guess the kind of key problem with all of this is we don't have a direct link right now between meteorites on the ground and asteroids in our solar system. So trying to reconstruct the geological history of our solar system and how it came to be really needs that geological context. It's like having 50,000 random rocks dumped in your back garden and no one told you where they collected them from. And then someone telling you to reconstruct the geological history of Scotland or the UK, it would be way, it, you can do it, but it'd be way easier if you knew where those rocks come from. Um, and that's where fireball camera networks and sample return missions like uh, Hayabusa come into their own where we can, for the first time, say conclusively that uh, S-type asteroids like Itakawa probably relate to L-type chondrites uh, that we have on Earth, uh, which is kind of really cool. Um, from that, well, once we start building up that picture of sort of like solar system geology, we can then start testing some of these really neat theories about how our solar system came to be. Uh, one of which is the Grand Tack hypothesis, which I really like. Uh, it's essentially a way of explaining why Mars is so small. So Mars formed further out than the Earth and should have had more material in the disk to uh, accrete from. And so models, early models kind of suggest there should be two super Earth-sized objects where Mars is, but Mars is much smaller than the Earth. And one way to explain this is Jupiter forms early, um, migrates inwards and nicks all Mars's stuff. And then Saturn comes in, sort of like holds it back so it doesn't go all the way into the uh, sort of to form a hot Jupiter and then drags it back out to its current position, um, which seems like a really sort of hellish way to explain why Mars is really small. Um, but it also has some other implications about, for example, how our asteroid belt came to be. So as Jupiter migrates inwards, it would destabilize all the S type asteroids that are forming in the inner solar system. And then as uh, Saturn helps it migrate back outwards, it would destabilize all the C type asteroids, the water rich ones uh, from the outer solar system and turn the inner solar system into a pinball machine, which eventually settles out in the asteroid belt, which is why the asteroid belt is such a mixture of asteroid types, which is kind of a really kind of cool idea. Um, chondritic meteorites, uh, in a nutshell, are made up of kind of three principal components. Um, when you look at them, there are chondrules from which chondritic meteorites get their name, which are kind of these spherical igneous melt droplets. Uh, so they're the solar system's first lavas. Uh, and then there's the matrix, which they're embedded in. This is a kind of fine grained, very heterogeneous mixture of lots of different minerals uh, that most of which form at relatively low temperatures. Uh, so immediately you have like mol molten rock right next to relatively low temperature minerals. So you've got this sort of temperature variation, but you also have these kind of weird objects called calcium aluminum inclusions or CAIs. Now they are the oldest minerals in our solar system or oldest materials. They define the age of the solar system at 4.567 billion years. Uh, and they formed right next to the sun uh, when it first started to shine. Um, we also think that chondrules and matrix formed much further out in the disk, like um, sort of, uh, yeah, but basically in a different location from where calcium aluminum inclusions come, came from, which gives us another kind of problem when we're trying to explain how chondrules form. We have, uh, sorry, how chondrites form. We have matrix and chondrules which form further out in the disk. And we have, so this is a very simple model of a protoplanetary disk with uh, the young sun. So you have uh, sort of your region further out where matrix and chondrules are forming, where water is ice. Uh, and then your calcium aluminium inclusions are forming close to the sun where rocks are a gas. So you've got this huge temperature difference. And somehow we've got to get those two to mix together um, and bring calcium aluminium inclusions into where matrix and chondrules are forming. So they all end up in the same rock. Um, and there are a number of ways to do that. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to sort of test some of them by studying these meteorites. <clears throat> However, these meteorites are complicated. Uh, and you see that complexity at every scale. So this is a slab of a meteorite called Allende, and you can see it's quite diverse. You have these kind of white blobs, uh, black areas, sort of in this gray area, but they're all different sizes. You kind of have this variation all the way through. 
And when we study these things, we tend to only get a thin section. So we get basically one centimeter across 30 microns thick slice of these rocks. And so you can see if we just got where that red box is, we're missing a whole lot of the complexity uh, in that rock. But when we look at that uh, sort of centimeter size slice on a millimeter scale, we see that that is incredibly diverse as well. We have uh, these sort of like different types of chondrules, a very heterogeneous matrix. Uh, and then if we go even further down to the micrometer scale, uh, this is sort of an electron backscatter diffraction crystallography map. Uh, all the different colors represent different minerals and you can see there's quite a lot of diversity and complexity there too. Uh, and then when you go down to the nanometer scale, so we're talking about if you take a human hair like a hundred times thinner than a human hair or a thousand times thinner than a human hair, we see complexity there as well. So we have this incredible diversity of textures, mineralogies, uh, microstructures all the way down. Um, and kind of the question you get at the end of that is, okay, well, let's go one step further. What about the picometer scale? Um, and that's kind of where this whole idea of correlative microscopy comes in to its own is we need to capture all that complexity in kind of a series of linked data sets. And so the idea would be to take your whole meteorite, uh, scan it in 3D using X-ray computed tomography to find out it's sort of like centimeter scale texture, then get it into an electron microscope to understand the sort of it's sort of like centimeter to micrometer scale features, electron backscatter diffraction to understand its crystallography, then dig out some small regions of interest uh, to look at sort of like the micrometer to nanometer scale using transmission QT diffraction or transmission electron microscopy techniques, which get you down to literally be able to image the atomic lattices. Uh, and then finally, uh, sort of at the end of this scale is a kind of new technique, a new kid on the block uh, called atom probe tomography. And so this is a kind of technique that allows you to literally measure individual atoms at a time. Um, the way atom probe kind of works uh, is you make a very, very fine needle that's about 100 nanometers across uh, and put it under a high voltage and fire a laser at it. Uh, that laser gives you just enough energy to ionize a single atom. Uh, that atom will then fly across this potential difference to hit a position sensitive detector. And the position it hits on the detector, uh, as well as kind of the uh, time of flight from laser pulse to impact, gives you the mass and charge of that um, atom or ion, uh, and also its 3D position in space. So you can then tell in 3D the atomic positions of all the atoms that were in this sample. Um, so this is kind of a typical data set. Each one of those dots rotating around is an individual atom that was measured. Uh, this kind of goes through one of those calcium aluminum inclusions into the matrix uh, of a meteorite. And what I really like is they see these like little red dots that are rotating around. They're a nano nugget of platinum. Um, so there's about 100 atoms of platinum in that bit. So you can literally get kind of this atomic scale, nano scale uh, sort of insight into these things, chemistry. To give you an idea about how big uh, an atom probe sample is, that's a human hair. It's about sort of a few tens of microns across. And I'm about to put a little red dot in it, which is the size of an atom probe needle. Uh, so hopefully people can't see that because, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's really small. Um, but yeah, we're so Atom Probe is really a sort of like at the, at the highest precision, high, the highest resolution we can go right now with modern technology. Um, this is the one over in Oxford uh, with me and my colleague Lydia uh, and sort of a bit, few stats about what it can do uh, for people who are interested in using it. Uh, the detection limits are around one atomic part per million. So if you have one atom of a particular element for every million atoms in your sample, you'll be able to see that atom. Uh, you get 100% ionization of the whole periodic table uh, in theory. So uh, you have no mass fractionation effects for isotopic analysis. You get everything that's in there equally. Um, and we've been kind of showing recently that you can actually detect molecular species, including OH and water, uh, which is gonna be really important later. And then you can kind of reconstruct it using the IVAS software to figure out where these elements are distributed through your volume. Um, and basically what we're allowed to do, what, what we're able to do then is look at something that's very, very small, like this grain that's around 200 nanometers, uh, measure it to try and understand how something that is 20 orders of magnitude in scale bigger uh, came to exist and the processes that were acting within it. Um, there's a little problem with atom probe. Uh, uh, in sort of geoscience in general, if you have a Venn diagram of people with atom probe experience versus geoscience experience, uh, it's a very kind of 
a small overlap. And for planetary science, it gets even worse. So if we zoom in here and sort of do the Venn diagram of a researcher with planetary science experience, you could probably count them on two hands and two toes. Um, so there's a basically what I'm kind of saying here, there's a whole wealth of opportunity to expand using this technique and really kind of get into the guts of sort of nanoscale implications for very large, uh, important questions. The way you prepare a sample for this atom probe technique, just for a little bit of detail, is using a focused ion beam or FIB. Uh, so essentially what that does is fire a stream of either gallium ions or a, a xenon plasma at your sample to mill out a sort of trench. And then you extract essentially a Toblerone shaped wedge. You attach a portion of that wedge that's around one micron across to this pre-grown silica post. Uh, so it looks kind of something like this. And then you mill away in a circular milling pattern until your needle is around 100 nanometers in diameter, um, which is what you need for the atom probe analysis. Um, if you're like me and you're interested in not just the bulk mineral, but um, for example, this 100 nanometer across particle, uh, we've developed some new approaches to be able to target those accurately. Uh, one of them is my favorite, it's called the button method. So you deposit, uh, using the electron beam, a button of platinum on your grain of interest. And you can then always track where that button is uh, all the way through. So you can target your annular milling pattern to make sure you end up with a needle that has your 100 nanometer grain at the top of your 100 nanometer wide needle, uh, which is really kind of fun. Uh, we've also developed a way of uh, looking at grain surfaces. So if you're interested in reaction profiles uh, or in my case, space weathering, and you, but you're really interested in that sort of top few tens of nanometers to hundreds of nanometers of your mineral, uh, we developed an approach where you sputter coat it with chrome or indeed any element that has the same ionization potential as your mineral. And you then, as your annular milling, leave a little bit of that protective layer on top. So it acts as a, not only a protective layer from the uh, harsh beam of the focused ion beam, but also then you can tell where it is um, as you're measuring it through atom probe. So in this case, we will see when we change from chrome going into olivine, where we hit that top grain boundary. And so all the changes that happen through there are the, we make sure we hit that surface that we're interested in. Um, the first atom probe paper in planetary science uh, was in 2014, and that was looking at pre-solar grains, uh, specifically pre-solar nanodiamonds. So in meteorites, if you melt them down in acid, uh, one of the things that kind of fall out are these literal like three to 10 nanometer size diamonds. Uh, and when people measure their bulk, they have this really wacky isotope composition that is nothing like anything we see uh, on Earth, basically, and or in our solar system. And so the interpretation is these must have formed prior to our solar system in another star. Um, and so Philip Heck and the group in Chicago did a really awesome job figuring out how to get these in the end of a needle. So you have this sort of like string of nanodiamonds all the way through and measure them. Uh, so here's their sort of atom probe data that they produced. And you see these like carbon rich nanodiamonds embedded in that platinum uh, residue that they sort of surrounded it with. And so we can measure the isotopic composition of an individual nano diamond, which is awesome. Um, there are a few challenges they had here because they're dealing with diamonds. So you're basically just got carbon to play with. Um, and there is a substantial overlap in their mass spectrum between carbon 13 and carbon 12 hydrides, uh, which basically, if you want to do carbon 13, carbon 12 isotope ratios, that's a challenge. And you uh, basically it's deconvolving that is really difficult. Their results of that, they showed these quite wacky uh, isotope uh, excursions, which if you just had the meteorite samples would potentially look like a pre-solar grain. Uh, but then so did all the standards they used. So they used detonation nanodiamonds, measured those in the exact same way, and they basically overlapped perfectly. So there's a lot of work trying to undo and untangle that sort of overlap uh, in the sort of isotopic composition of nanodiamonds, but kind of shows the proof of the concept that you can measure these and this is the only way you could measure such tiny objects uh, is using atom probe. So the rest of this talk is going to go, go through two case studies of how we've used atom probe in planetary science. Uh, one is to explore particle migration in the protoplanetary disk. So how did CAIs get out to where chondrules are? Uh, and then the origin of Earth's water. So where did Earth's oceans come from? Um, I'll start with 
particle migration. And this is kind of work I did with my PhD, and it was focusing on highly siderophile elements. So they are all the elements that basically are metal loving, highly, highly siderophile, uh, cider, metal, uh, file, love. So that's uh, elements like iron and nickel, but also uh, elements like rhenium, osmium, iridium, and platinum. Um, they're really important uh, for a lot of things in planetary science and uh, sort of terrestrial geoscience. Uh, up until recently, we didn't know where they formed in our universe uh, until the sort of recent LIGO observation of a neutron star merger. And while everyone else got really excited about gravitational waves, no one prizes and all that jazz, uh, I was quite excited because it's the first time we've seen direct evidence of our process nucleosynthesis, which forms all those elements like iridium and platinum. Uh, so we now know where these things are likely to be forming in our, in our galaxy. They're also really important for understanding planet formation, uh, particularly as our kind of crust and upper mantle has way more of these things than they should have. Because they're metal loving, they should all have gone to the core when our planet differentiated into a core mantle crust structure. However, we have an enrichment in these elements in the upper, in the sort of like upper mantle. And the idea there is this kind of like late accretion throwing chondritic like meteorites at the, at the sort of final stages of Earth's formation to give us that sort of kick up that enrichment in highly siderophile elements in our upper mantle. And they're also the dead ringer for uh, large impact extinction events. So um, this is a sort of artist impression of the Chicxulub impact crater uh, that knocked off the dinosaurs, which generated a global layer of iridium um, around the whole planet, which you can see around 65 million years ago. Um, however, what I focused my PhD on is a particular mineral group called refractory metal nuggets. Uh, these are tiny sub-micrometer particles that are highly enriched in osmium, iridium, and platinum. Uh, they're found in all components of primitive uh, carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. And the elements inside them are not only highly siderophile, but they're also very refractory. So they uh, condense at incredibly high temperatures, above 2,000 degrees or so. So the only place that can really form them uh, is right next to the sun. And if you condensed out a nebula gas of solar composition, these are the first minerals that will fall out of that gas. So the first solids in our solar system are potentially these little guys. Um, but also, because they're highly siderophile, because they're highly refractory, there's almost nothing you can do to them after you form them. So there's been an idea knocking around since the 70s that potentially some of these are pre-solar, so formed before our solar system. But we just haven't had the ability till now to measure the isotopic composition to prove that one way or another. Um, and so kind of the first thing I did was using this kind of correlative microscopy technique, scanned hundreds of these meteorite sections and found a whole bunch of these refractory metal nuggets everywhere and measured their chemistry. Um, and this is kind of like a shotgun spider plot, so don't, don't worry about it too much. But uh, basically this block here cannot be explained by any process we are aware of in our solar system. This line that kind of goes through here can be explained by either condensation from a gas or crystallization from a melt. Uh, this region down here can be explained by reactions with sulfur, so adding sulfur into the mix. Uh, I'd love if anyone has any ideas about this. I cannot make this area explainable by any known process in our solar system. Uh, so that's kind of where I focused sort of a more tailored search for potentially this pre-solar population. Their crystallography is also whack. Uh, so we sort of dug out a few of them, uh, measured them by transmission electron microscopy to understand their crystallography, as well as transmission Kikuchi diffraction. And we found that many of them had interesting crystallographic orientation relationships with their host grain. In this case, it's a calcium aluminum inclusion. And the orientation of the metal grain is identical uh, to the orientation of its host. Uh, in this case, a mineral called acumenite, uh, which is sort of typical for calcium aluminum inclusion. So, this kind of suggests that this refractory metal nugget formed first. So it was floating around uh, in the solar system first, and then this calcium aluminum inclusion nucleated around it. Um, we also then started measuring these things by atom probe, again, digging out these 100 uh, nanometer sized particles and putting them on the end of a needle to measure their sort of uh, composition. And we started seeing some interesting things we weren't expecting. We saw all the elements we were expecting, like tungsten, rhenium, osmium, uh, iridium, ruthenium. That was all fine. And then we saw these weird set of peaks uh, sort of further up and also around the sort of 32, 34 mark, uh, which were sort of dead ringers for sulfur, uh, which didn't make a lot of sense. Because if you look at these things where they form in terms of their volatility, uh, so basically what temperature they condense at, 
the rhenium osmium iridium form at ridiculously high temperatures or condense at ridiculously high temperatures. Sulfur is like a thousand degrees less refractory. So it condenses a thousand degrees lower temperature. Um, and it's kind of evenly distributed through these grains. It's not like located in any one place. Uh, so it's not sort of some like later alteration. It's not a, a product of alteration on the asteroid. This is a indigenous thing to this uh, mineral that's been there from the get go. And so we think these minerals were floating around in space, isolated on their own uh, before they were incorporated into calcium aluminum inclusions. And that brings us on to how do we get the sulfur in there? And if you look at where sulfur is condensing, so this is um, normalized hydrogen sulfide versus uh, radius in the solar system in astronomical units, our refractory metal nuggets should be forming around there or inwards, uh, and sulfidation reactions can only occur a bit further out from like 1.5 AU to 3. And so we have to have these refractory metal nuggets somehow getting into this region of our solar system where sulfur can condense. Um, and you can do that, that's fine. You can migrate it outwards, that's not a problem, but then it's got to get back in to where those calcium aluminium inclusions are forming, uh, where those CAIs are forming near the young sun. And if you can do that, you would also be able to bring the entire rest of the protoplanetary disk in with you. So all those matrix materials in the outer solar system would be sent through this inner solar system meat grinder, where you'd see really high temperatures. Um, and so everything would look the same. There'd be no different asteroid types. There'd be no uh, different planet types. Everything would look like a calcium aluminium inclusion, which isn't the case. Uh, so we predicted that potentially there should be some sort of gap, some barrier that stops uh, material from the outer solar system coming in to where the sulfidation reactions are occurring, which allows then these refractory metal nuggets to cycle in that region, get back into calcium aluminium inclusions, and then get ejected somehow uh, out into this outer solar system where condors and CAIs are forming. Uh, and that then harks back to that ALMA image that I showed you at the beginning, which would suggest that that is indeed the case. Those gaps, those ring systems in our protoplanetary disk would stop that particle migration. So potentially the, only the inner solar system, uh, sort of very inner solar system, was able to migrate uh, in its own little reservoir, uh, allowing refractory metal nuggets to migrate in and now incorporate some sulfur and then get back in and uh, in, get incorporated within these calcium aluminium inclusions. But potentially this could be a start of explaining all meteorite types. If you assume that all meteorite types formed in each ring of our protoplanetary disk, they would be isolated from each other. They would have their own distinct chemistry, their own distinct textures and own distinct mineralogy, which is what we see in the meteorite records. This is kind of a new idea. Um, I think it's known as the fiefdom model uh, from antiquity about sort of these kind of ring systems, which is kind of nice. Um, we also then wanted to, to try and test whether we could identify any of these things as having a pre-solar origin. And to do that, you need to measure their isotope. So basically uh, the same element for a different uh, weight because it has a different number of neutrons. Um, however, no one had done isotopic analysis of rhenium uh, or osmium or any of these elements before in the atom probe. So we then spent a year of our lives doing a whole load of statistics, a whole load of standards, which I won't bore you with. It's a, uh, my colleagues coined this and named this paper the eye bleedy one because it was so long and dull. Um, but by the end of it, you, we sort of showed that you can get uh, isotopic measurements robustly uh, in a standardized way using atom probe. Uh, and your results will be within error uh, of what they're expected to be. So then we were able to take that method and apply it to these refractory metal nuggets. And uh, we measured 10 whole grains. Uh, and they all plot on this chondritic evolution line for rhenium and osmium. The reason we picked rhenium and osmium uh, is because it's a radiogenic isotope. Rhenium 187 decays to osmium 187 over 41 billion years. So we can measure this and potentially get an age from them and figure out how old these grains were or how, old, how long it's been since these grains crystallized or formed. And what's nice is all these grains plot on this chondritic evolution line, which is exactly what we'd expect for a rock of chondritic composition that formed four and a half billion years ago and slowly evolved over time. So if you figure out a model age for these, they're around 4.5 billion years, which is exactly what we'd expect for something that formed in our early solar system. Uh, except one, because there's always an exception. Uh, and there's one other grain that was a bit weird and plotted down here, uh, which is in this subchondritic range. So basically everything in our solar system should plot on this line or above. And this is down here and outside of error. Um, and there is almost nothing I can now do to the data to change that 
except make it worse, make it less osmium 187 rich. So this, by any strict definition, would be a pre-solar grain. Um, and potentially, because it's got rhenium and osmium in it, we could uh, estimate a model age. So if we make the dangerous assumption that it has a similar sort of isotopic evolution uh, as chondrites in our solar system, we can figure out how old this thing might have been. Um, before I tell you the number, I'd also like to sort of highlight that it's an unusual grain. Uh, it was found in a sulfide in a rim of a chondral. Uh, most of these grains are found in calcium aluminium inclusions. So this is in an unusual petrologic location. Um, but yeah, it's a, basically uh, it comes out at 7.9 plus or minus 2 uh, billion years old, which is older than the solar system by uh, at least uh, half a billion years out, uh, outside of error. So potentially, if this is true, and I, I really have run out of ideas over the last sort of five years trying to make this wrong, uh, to get this to fit the rest of the data. So we, I'm pretty confident that we can say this is a pre-solar grain now. And if we can assume this chondritic evolution line, it will be the oldest solid object ever dated uh, using absolute dating mechanisms, which is really cool. Uh, one final point before I move on to our next thing. It also has rhenium in it, which I didn't take into account to get the 7.9 uh, age. Um, if I subtract the rhenium to sort of get a sort of rhenium model age, uh, it's around the age of the galaxy, uh, which, is, which is bonkers. Uh, but also potentially might make some sense in terms of how we think our early galaxy formed when our early galaxy was basically full of big stars dying really quickly that our process nucleosynthesis uh, style events happening all the time, you suddenly get a lot of rhenium osmium forming uh, in that time period. So it's not this, I'm not sure about this number. I wouldn't like hand my hat on it, but there could be good reasons why it could be real. Um, so potentially uh, we were very lucky and got one of the pre-solar grains uh, in our study and so some of these refractory metal nuggets may not only tell us something about the environment around our sun when it first started to shine and how particles moving in that inner solar system region, it also may give us an insight into the sort of life and death of giant stars in our galaxy. And particularly if we can date them using rhenium osmium uh, radio major metric dating, figure out when they formed. Uh, so that was my PhD. Uh, I'm now going to go on to the origin of Earth's water, uh, which is kind of what I've been doing for my postdoc and now lectureship at the University of Glasgow. Um, and basically, it's, I'm trying to answer this question about where did, Earth ocean, where did Earth's oceans come from? Um, as I said, there's that snow line in our protoplanetary disk, inside of which the water is in the gas phase, out width of which uh, water is in the ice phase. Earth formed inside of that snow line, and so should have formed much drier than we see today. So the kind of front-running ideas for where Earth got its oceans from is we throw extraterrestrial material at it. So that's stuff like comets like asteroids or even potentially ingassing from that nebula somehow. Um, however, one unexplored reservoir uh, that we've been kind of looking into is could the sun have anything to do with it, particularly the solar wind? Um, and it's essentially trying to explain this problem graph, uh, which is the deuterium hydrogen ratio. So basically heavy water versus light water. Earth sits around there. Asteroids don't match Earth's oceans. They're slightly heavier on average. Um, same with the asteroid Vesta, it's slightly heavier on average than the Earth. Comets are even worse, they're really heavy uh, compared to the Earth, so you can't really add many of them to Earth's ocean, to, to the Earth to explain Earth's oceans. And then to make matters even worse, the only thing really on the other side of the graph is the sun. And now I'm not suggesting we throw the sun at the Earth to add some water, because that would be bad for everyone involved, but there potentially is a, there's a mismatch in the mass balance. There's a bunch of objects that we can measure uh, in our solar system, and there's only one thing on the other side of the graph that could come together to explain Earth's ocean composition. And one way we could get around this is through a process called space weathering. Now, space weathering is the combination of the solar wind, which is a stream of mostly hydrogen ions, uh, micrometeorite impacts, and galactic cosmic rays. And these processes affect every surface exposed to the vacuum of space. So that's stuff like comets, like Mercury, the moon, billionaire's car, apparently, um, and asteroids, so like the asteroid Itakawa. And like I mentioned, uh, we got three whole particles at Glasgow to study uh, in the atom probe to look at the space weathering processes. Um, 
People have done previous studies on space weathering. This one is an example of sort of an interplanetary dust particle. And on the outer surface, literally the outer 100 nanometers, you get this sort of like vesicular texture. It goes amorphous. You get um, sort of high end nanoparticles. And then uh, John Bradley um, in 2014 uh, was able using veals uh, in the TEM to measure, sort of detect an OH bond, uh, which is sort of an indication that in this layer, there is water forming. Um, and essentially the sort of rough formula for this is the sun produces protons or hydrogen. Uh, you add them to rocks in space uh, and that produces water. So essentially that hydrogen comes in, boots out one of the cations, uh, nicks an oxygen, produces OH, then another hydrogen ion comes in and produces H2O. Um, and people have shown this both experimentally uh, and by observing interplanetary dust particles. And so what we're expecting to see if there is water enrichment in this outer surface, uh, if you put a rock in space, uh, its outer surface will get a bit of perspiration and you should be able to measure that. Uh, what that kind of would look like if this is our rock, the outer sort of few hundred nanometers would be uh, enriched in water. And so we took some uh, particles from the asteroid Itakawa. We also irradiated some San Carlos olivine with deuterium ions to sort of as a standard uh, as well as just leaving some San Carlos olivine as a standard in the lab just to see what the terrestrial atmosphere does to it. And then we measured this by atom probe TEM and FIBTOF sims. Uh, the TEM data was really interesting. It kind of showed us it's a relatively immature space weathering surface. Uh, like you can still see there's sort of crystal lattices going all the way through to the surface. So it hasn't amorphosed that surface uh, in any way. There's no sort of iron nanoparticles anywhere. There's a few density differences and it's quite beam sensitive, which shows it potentially might be volatile rich. Um, but the kind of real interesting stuff comes in this atom probe data of that outer surface. So these are results from our standards. So we have our chrome capping layer going through into our San Carlos olivine that was irradiated with deuterium. And in this, we see this big bulge, uh, in, in, uh, the, which is enriched in deuterium, DO, D2O, uh, which you can kind of see from the sort of atomic clouds here which is really nice. What you don't see is an enrichment in hydrogen and OH, which is really important. Um, and our San Carlos olivine that we just left in the lab, uh, we didn't see anything at all. We just see the chrome cap going into olivine uh, and the line is completely flat for water and OH and hydrogen, which is really nice. That's exactly what we'd expect it to be. Um, the really cool thing is comes from the measurements of Itakawa itself, these particles that we got from the Japanese Space Agency. And if you look at the distribution of OH ions in this sort of like teal and H2O in this blue, you can see they're enriched in the top sort of 40 or 50 nanometers or so. We can quantify that and sort of show exactly how much is there. Uh, and it looks to be between like 0.8 atomic percent and around 1.6 atomic percent. So basically 1% of this uh, outer surface is now water, uh, which is induced by the solar wind. Our standards suggest there's no terrestrial contamination, no uh, adsorption of water, uh, and these things are relatively stable for at least the time period these rocks have been on Earth. So we think this is a real water signal produced by solar wind irradiation onto this rock. Um, and then we sort of got into the idea about how, okay, how much water can you introduce into a particle in this way? So this is a graph of water content in atomic percent versus uh, particle diameter. So obviously meteorites and stuff up here, barely any water is gonna get put into a sort of few meter sized object uh, up, up at this end of the scale. But once you get down to stuff like the, the size of a cosmic dust particle or an interplanetary dust particle or the matrix of chondritic meteorites, you can suddenly, suddenly start putting a substantial amount of water up to about one or two atomic percent. Uh, which is sizable. So for example, in Itakawa's regolith, which is about on average 100 micron grain size, uh, from the water we measured by atom probe, for every meter cubed of Itakawa regolith, you would be able to get 20 liters of water out, which is really cool for kind of in situ resource utilization. So for example, if you took a meter cubed of the moon, because it would be a very similar kind of composition to this, and would have a very similar sort of space weathering effect, and put it in a microwave, believe it or not, uh, the iron nanoparticles that are produced by space weathering, metal in a microwave, not good, would cause that regolith to melt, which would release very easily this uh, 20 liters of water that we see. So potentially space weathering 
of airless worlds could provide a renewable source of water uh, in our solar system, which is kind of a fun implication. Um, but then if we think about what does this mean for the early Earth and how Earth's water budget, the flux of particle sizes to the Earth uh, is quite dramatically different. So for meteorites, there's all, like there are a lot. So one, if it's one meteorite of a searchable size hits the UK every year. But if there's 50,000 tons per year, that's kind of nothing. Um, big stuff like asteroids and comets, they're really rare kind of events. Um, so anything that would deliver sort of substantial water not going to happen very often. But of that 50,000 tons, the vast majority is of interplanetary dust particles, this really small fine grain material that's been space weathered, and so would have substantial amounts of water in it from the sun. Um, this would also be true in our early solar system, when sort of like the nebula disk has dissipated and the disk becomes transparent to the solar wind. Quite a lot of the mass in our solar system at that time would still be made up of small particles. And when we look out at solar systems in, that are forming right now in the same stage, they are very dust rich. And so potentially there is a lot of material out there that will be very water rich because of irradiation from the sun. And so potentially we could combine uh, the sun as long as it's in the form of space weathering onto interplanetary dust particle sized material, and then add that to the earth to reconcile Earth's water budget. So um, this is a graph kind of modeling that comparison. So comparing CR chondrites, um, CMCI chondrites, and the average versus 100% uh, contribution of space weathered small particles and 0% contribution. And so between maybe around sort of 70 to 40% of Earth's final mass, if, if 40 to 70% of Earth's final mass was delivered by these small particles, we could now completely explain Earth's water budget and potentially even be allowed to add a little bit of cometary material in to sort of balance that book and balance that budget. Uh, so, so yeah, so in a nutshell, we can use atom probe tomography to sort of finally answer the question of where Earth's oceans came from. Um, that if you have, you can still have majority of water-rich asteroids and maybe a few cometary materials, but as long as you add a few small particles that have been uh, irradiated by the solar wind from the sun, we can now explain where Earth's oceans came from. So uh, kind of in conclusion, thanks very much for listening to this. Um, hopefully you can see that atom probe as a technique has a huge potential in planetary science. Um, there are still so many things we can do with it. We've barely scratched the surface. We're, every time we look at a new mineral, we're starting to see things we've never seen before, new nanophases, nanostructures, all of which can give us a new atomic window into our solar system and how our solar system came to be. Uh, so I'm hopeful we're on the crest of a nanoplanetary revolution where lots of people get into looking in sort of like intimate detail of planetary materials, but also geological materials or any material. Um, uh, and then, yeah, just uh, obviously this is, science doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, I am indebted to all these wonderful humans that put up with me on a regular basis and I have sort of the honor to work with all around the world. Um, and if you're interested in planetary science in general, I would like to warmly invite you to the annual meeting of the Meteoritical Society, which was supposed to happen this, uh, sorry, last year, but of course uh, we were in a pandemic, so we, that got cancelled, and we are now holding uh, the Meteoritical Society meeting in 2022, uh, which will be really fun. There will be a Kaylee, lots of whiskey, and some really nice planetary science. So yeah, thanks very much for listening. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you all, and happy to take any questions.